Rory was playing basketball in school gym, slipped, cut his elbow on the gym floor. Teacher put a bandaid on it, and that was on Tuesday. And uh, Rory was dead on Sunday at six o'clock. How can a young boy go from merely cutting himself on a school gym, playing basketball, to a morgue in five days? Rory's a very gentle kid. Um, he engaged a lot with people. He was a foot bigger than everyone else and big, broad young man. But yet when all the young, new kids came in, he looked after them. I think it became more obvious as he got older that he was becoming a leader. We, we trusted a lot of people. We trusted that the school would look after him if he fell, that they would clean a cut. They didn't. We trusted that our pediatrician would pick up on signs if he was ill. She didn't. The doctor discharged him. The following morning, he was no better. Or he began to turn yellow and the tip of his nose started to turn black. We just ran. We ran with him back into the hospital. I got one doctor to come speak with me and uh, he said to me, your son is very ill. And then he was brought up to the intensive care unit. That was on Friday night and he was dead on Sunday evening. Yeah. I don't even know how to describe losing him. It's, um, there was a voice in my life that I loved that was gone. Well, we will spend the rest of our days reliving that. We spend the last four years reliving it and until the day we die, we'll relive it. The big thing was nobody seemed to know the signs of sepsis and nobody knew that he was septic. We had never heard of this word called sepsis. But then we find that 50% of Americans have never heard of it. Now we, hear, we know that it's the largest killer of children in the world. When we went online and looking about sepsis, there was nothing. My wife went on to CDC. There was nothing on CDC about sepsis. Yes, it was killing a quarter of a million Americans a year. We gave our story to the New York Times and it was the most shared ever article in the New York Times. And some weeks later, we got a, an indirect message from a woman in Florida. And she said, I want to thank you for saving our son's life. And she said, my son was in a hospital in Florida. The doctors didn't know what was wrong with him. We knew he was very sick. And in infestation, I was talking to my sister and she said, well, I read a story in the New York Times about some boy who died. Could this be sepsis? It was sepsis. And the woman wrote to us, I'm sitting here with my boy beside my pool in Florida. My 11 year old boy, and I owe it to you and your family. And our daughter, Kathleen said, well, isn't it a pity someone hadn't done that for Rory? I am so thankful for the notes that we get from people, but I so wish that I had known the signs and that I wasn't in this situation. Rory's death was totally preventable. We came to Washington, knocked on many doors, and we had the first hearing it was televised live on C-SPAN, on sepsis. We drew up language called Rory's Regulations. Which ensures that all hospitals have mandatory sepsis protocols in place. Rory's Regulations would save between five and 8,000 New Yorkers each year. However, that's only in one state. There are 49 other states. It feels very bittersweet because um, I couldn't save my son's life, but I know we're saving other lives. The frustration is that they had to find out about it from us, that we were their source of information. We have an empty bed. We sit down at our table in the evening, there are three chairs filled, there's one empty chair. 